Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time. We're here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin, and we're going to be reading the second half of chapter 39 of Little Women today by Louisa May Alcott. Um, chapter 39 was titled Lazy Lawrence, and uh, Lawrence, Laurie, and Amy were just talking um, and moving from conversations about her art and what she's going to do next to um, how she, let's see, how she was going to polish up other talents and be an ornament to society. <laughs> so, Laurie responds, good, and here's where Fred Vaughn comes in, I fancy. Amy preserved a discreet silence, but there was a conscious look in her downcast face that made Laurie sit up and say gravely, now I'm going to play brother and ask questions, may I? I don't promise to answer. Your face will, if your tongue don't. You aren't woman of the world enough yet to hide your feelings, my dear. I've heard rumors about Fred and you last year, and it's my private opinion that if he had not been called home so suddenly and detained so long, that something would have come of it, eh? That's not for me to say, was Amy's prim reply, but her lips would smile, and there was a traitorous sparkle of the eye which betrayed that she knew her power and enjoyed the knowledge. You are not engaged, I hope? And Laurie looked very elder brotherly and grave of all of, all of a sudden. No, but you will be if he comes back and goes properly down upon his knees, won't you? Very likely. Then you are fond of old Fred. I could be if I tried. But you don't intend to try it until the proper moment. Bless my soul, what unearthly prudence! Here's a good fellow, Amy, but not the man I fancied you like. He is rich, a gentleman, and has delightful manners, began Amy, trying to be quite cool and dignified, but feeling a little ashamed of herself in spite of the sincerity of her intentions. I understand. Queens of society can't get on without money, so you mean to make a good match and start in that way? Quite right and proper as the world goes, but it sounds odd from the lips of one of your mother's girls. True, nevertheless, a short speech, but the quiet decision with which it was uttered contrasted curiously with the young speaker. Larry felt this instinctively and laid himself down again with a sense of disappointment which he could not explain. His look in silence, as well as a certain inward self-disapproval, ruffled Amy and made her resolve to deliver her lecture without delay. I wish you'd do me the favor to rouse yourself a little, she said sharply. Do it for me, there's a dear girl. I could if I tried. And she looked as if she would like doing it in the most summary style. Try then, I give you leave, returned Laurie, who enjoyed having someone to tease after his long abstinence from this favorite pastime. You'd be angry in five minutes. I'm never angry with you. It takes two flints to make a fire. You are as cool and soft as snow. You don't know what I can do. Snow produces a glow and a tingle, if applied rightly. Your indifference is half aff affectation, and a good stirring up would prove it. Stir away, it won't hurt me, and it may, may, it may amuse you, as the big man said when his little wife beat him. Regard me in the light of a husband or a carpet, and beat until you're tired, if that sort of exercise agrees with you. Being decidedly nettled herself, and longing to see him shake off the apathy that so altered him, Amy sharpened both tongue and pencil, and began. Flo and I have got a new name for you. It's Lazy Lawrence. How do you like it? She thought it would annoy him, but he only folded his arms under his head with an in imperturbable. That's not bad. Thank you, ladies. Do you want to know what I honestly think of you? pining to be told. Well, I despise you. If she had even said I hate you in a petulant or coquettish tone, he would have laughed and rather liked it. But the grave, almost sad accent of her voice made him open his eyes and ask quickly, why, if you please? Because with every chance for being good, useful, and happy, you are faulty, lazy, and miserable. Strong language, mademoiselle. If you like it, I'll go on. Pray do, it's quite interesting. I thought you'd find it so. Selfish, pe selfish people always like to talk about themselves. 
Am I selfish? The question slipped out involuntarily, and in a tone of surprise, for the one virtue on which he prided himself was generosity. Yes, very selfish, continued Amy, in a calm, cool voice, twice as effective just then as an angry one. I'll show you how, for I've studied you while we've been frolicking, and I'm not at all satisfied with you. Here you have been abroad nearly six months, and done nothing but waste time and money, and disappoint your friends. Isn't a fellow to have any pleasure after a four years grind? You don't look as if you've had much. At any rate, you're none better for it, none the better for it, as far as I can see. I said when we first met that you had improved. Now I take it all back, for I don't think you half so nice as when I left you at home. You've grown abominably lazy. You like gossip and waste time on frivolous things. You are contented to be petted and admired by silly people instead of being loved and respected by wise ones. With money, talent, position, health, and beauty, ah, you like that old vanity. But it's the truth, so I can't help saying it. With all these splendid things to use and enjoy, you can find nothing to do but dawdle, and instead of being the man you might and ought to be, you're only... There she stopped, with a look that had both pain and pity in it. St. Lawrence on a gridiron, added Laurie, blandly finishing the sentence. But the lecture began to take effect, for there was a wide awake sparkle in his eyes now, and a half angry, half injured expression replaced the former indifference. I supposed you'd take it so. You men tell us we are angels and say that we can make you whatever we will. But the instant we honestly try to do you good, you laugh at us and won't listen, which proves how much your flattery is worth. Amy spoke bitterly and turned her back on the exasperating martyr at her feet. In a minute, a hand came down over the page so that she could not draw, and Laurie's voice said, with a droll imitation of a penitent child, I will be good. Oh, I will be good. But Amy did not laugh, for she was in earnest, and tapping on the outspread hand with her pencil, said soberly, Aren't you ashamed of a hand like that? It's as soft and as white as a woman's, and looks as if it never did anything but wear Jovin's best gloves and pick flowers for ladies. You are not a dandy, thank heaven. So I'm glad to see there are no diamonds or big seal rings on it. Only the little old one Joe gave you so long ago. Dear soul, I wish she was here to help me. So do I. The hand vanished as suddenly as it came, and there was energy enough in the echo of her wish to suit even Amy. She glanced down at him with a new thought in her mind, but he was lying with his hat half over his face, as if for shade, and his mustache hid his mouth. She only saw his chest rise and fall with a long breath that might have been a sigh, and the hand that wore the ring nestled down into the grass, as if to hide something too precious or too tender to be spoken of. All in a minute, various hints and trifles assumed shape and significance in Amy's mind and told her what her sister never had confided to her. She remembered that Laurie never spoke voluntarily of Joe. She recalled the shadow on his face just now, the change in his character, and the wearing of the little old ring, which was no ornament to a handsome hand. Girls are quick to read such signs and feel their eloquence. Amy had fancied that Perhaps a love trouble was at the bottom of the alteration, and now she was sure of it. Her keen eyes filled, and when she spoke again, it was in a voice that could be beautifully soft and kind when she chose to make it so. I know I have no right to talk to you so, Laurie, and if you weren't the sweetest tempered fellow in the world, you would be very angry with me. But we are all so fond and proud of you, I couldn't bear to think that they should be disappointed in you at home as I have been though perhaps they would understand the change better than I do. I think they would, came from under the hat in a grim tone, quite as touching as a broken one. They ought to have told me, and not let me go blundering and scolding, when I should have been more kind and patient than ever. I never did like that Miss Randall, and now I hate her, said artful Amy, wishing to be sure of her facts this time. Hang Miss Randall, and Laurie knocked the hat off his face with a look that left no doubt of his sentiments toward that young lady. I beg pardon, I thought, and there she paused diplomatically. 
No, you didn't. You know perfectly well I never cared for anyone but Joe. Laurie said that in his old impetuous tone and turned his face away as he spoke. I did think so, but as they never said anything about it and you came away, I suppose I was mistaken. And Joe wouldn't be kind to you? Why, I was sure she loved you dearly. She was kind, but not in the right way. And it's lucky for her she didn't love me, for I'm the good-for-nothing fellow you think me. It's her fault, though, and you may tell her so. The hard, bitter look came back again as he said that, and it troubled Amy, for she did not know what balm to apply. I was wrong. I didn't know. I'm very sorry I was so cross, but I can't help wishing you'd bear it better, Teddy dear. Don't. That's her name for me. And Laurie put up his hand with a quick gesture to stop the words spoken in Joe's half-kind, half-reproachful tone. Wait until you've tried it yourself, he added in a low voice as he pulled up the grass by the handful. I'd take it manfully and be respected if I couldn't be loved, cried Amy, with the decision of no one who knew nothing about it. Oh, with the decision of one who knew nothing about it. Now Laurie flattered himself that he had borne it remarkably well, making no moan, asking no sympathy, and taking his trouble away to live it down alone. Amy's lecture put the matter in a new light, and for the first time it did look weak and selfish to lose heart at the first failure and shut himself up in moody indifference. He felt as if suddenly shaken out of a pensive dream and found it impossible to go to sleep again. Presently, he sat up and asked slowly, do you think Joe would despise me as you do? Yes, if she saw you now, she hates lazy people. Why don't you do something splendid and make her love you? I did my best, but it was no use. Graduating well, you mean? That was no more than you ought to have done, for your grandfather's sake. It would have been shameful to fail after spending so much time and money when everyone knew you could do well. I did fail, say what you will, for Joe wouldn't love me began Laurie, leaning his head on his hand in a despondent attitude. No, you didn't, and you'll say so in the end, for it did you good, and proved that you could do something if you tried. If you only set about another task of some sort, soon you'd, be, you'd soon be your hearty, happy self again, and forget your trouble. That's impossible. Try it and see. You needn't shrug your shoulders and think much she knows about such things. I don't pretend to be wise, but I am observing, and I see a great deal more than you'd imagine. I'm interested in other people's experiences and inconsistencies, and though I can't explain, I remember and use them for my own benefit. Love, Joe, all your days if you choose, but don't let it spoil you, for it's wicked to throw away so many good gifts because you can't have the one you want. There, I won't lecture any more, for I know you'll wake up and be a man in spite of that hard-hearted girl. Neither spoke for several minutes. Laurie sat turning the little ring on his finger, and Amy put the last touches to the hasty sketch that she had been working at while she talked. Presently, she put it on his knee, merely saying, how do you like that? He looked and then he smiled, as he could not well help doing, for it was capitally done. The long, lazy figure on the grass with listless face, half-shut eyes, and one hand holding a cigar, from which came the little wreath of smoke that encircled the dreamer's head. How well you draw, he said, with genuine surprise and pleasure at her skill, adding with a half laugh, yes, that's me. As you are, this is as you were. And Amy laid another sketch beside the one he held. It was not so nearly well done, but there was a life and spirit in it, which atoned for many faults and it recalled the past so vividly that a sudden change swept over the young man's face as he looked. Only a rough sketch of Laurie taming a horse. Hat and coat were off, and every line of the active figure, resolute face and commanding attitude, was full of energy and meaning. The handsome brute, just subdued, stood arching his neck under the tightly drawn rein, with one foot impatiently pawing the ground, and ears pricked up as if listening for the voice that had mastered him. In the ruffled mane, the rider's breezy hair and erect attitude, there was a suggestion of suddenly arrested motion, of strength, courage, and youthful buoyancy that contrasted sharply with the supine grace of the dolce far 
niente sketch. Laurie said nothing, but as his eye went from one to the other, Amy saw him flush up and fold his lips together as if he read and accepted the little lesson that she had given him. That satisfied her, and without waiting for him to speak, she said in her sprightly way, don't you remember, excuse me, don't you remember the day you played Rary with Puck and we all looked on? Meg and Beth were frightened, but Joe clapped and pranced, and I sat on the fence and drew you. I found that sketch in my portfolio the other day, touched it up, and kept it to show you. Much obliged. You've improved immensely since then, and I congratulate you. May I venture to suggest in A Honeymoon Paradise that five o'clock is the dinner hour at your hotel? Lori rose as he spoke, returned the pictures with a smile and a bow, and looked at his watch as if to remind her that even moral lectures should have an end. He tried to resume his former easy, indifferent air, but it was an affect affectation now, for the rousing had been more efficacious than he would confess. Amy felt the shade of coldness in his manner and said to herself, Now I've offended him. Well, if it does him good, I'm glad. If it makes him hate me, I'm sorry. But it's true, and I can't take back a word of it. They laughed and chatted all the way home, and little Baptiste, up behind, thought that Monsieur and Mademoiselle were in charming spirits. But both felt ill at ease. The friendly frankness was disturbed. The sunshine had a shadow over it. And despite their apparent gaiety, they were... <laughs> Despite their apparent gaiety, there was a secret discontent in the heart of each. Shall we see you this evening, mon frere? asked Amy as they parted at her aunt's door. Unfortunately, I have an engagement. Au revoir, mademoiselle, and Laurie bent as if to kiss her hand, in the foreign fashion, which became him better than many men. Something in his face made Amy say, quickly and warmly, No, be yourself with me, Laurie, and part in the good old way. I'd rather have a hearty English handshake than all the sentimental salutations in France. Goodbye, dear. And with these words, uttered in the tone she liked, Laurie left her, after a handshake most painful in its heartiness. Next morning, instead of the casual or the usual call, Amy received a note which made her smile at the beginning and sigh at the end. My dear mentor, please make my adieu to your aunt and exalt within yourself, for lazy Lawrence has gone to his grandpa, like the best of boys. A pleasant winter to you, and may the gods grant you a blissful honeymoon at Valrosa. I think Fred would be benefited by a rouser. Tell him so, with my congratulations. Yours gratefully, Telemachus. Good boy, I'm glad he's gone, said Amy, with an approving smile. The next minute her face fell as she glanced about the empty room adding with an involuntary sigh, yes, I am glad, but how I shall miss him. That's the end of our chapter 39. We'll see you next time.